Why is it that all you need to grow a healthy plant is a crack in the pavement? Yeah. And you're telling me you can't grow a tree in the Amazon. Well, maybe basin. we should pave over uh, the uh, areas. That's <laughs> we should pave them over and then just uh, put some cracks in them. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chuck. This is Star Talk. Neil deGrasse Tyson here, your personal astrophysicist. Got with me Chuck Knight. Chucky baby, how you doing? Hey Neil, what's happening? So in this episode, we're gonna explore what role space technology, satellite imagery, has in understanding what goes on on Earth's surface. In this particular case, related to mining. Yeah. The mining of gold in the Amazon, which involves not only the deforestation of trees, but also a poisoning of the environment from mercury that was used in the extraction of the gold. Tell me more about this episode, because you did a lot of the homework behind well, it. Well, you know, it's great that you mentioned space and the connection of space to Earth. We know that there are thousands of satellites that are active right thousands, now. Thousands. 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 Thanks a lot, Elon. <laughs> Way to go. He's half Way of them. Way to go, baby. Most of them are yours, baby. Way to go. I'm winning space. Um, <laughs> I win. Whoever dies with the most satellites wins. wins. That's it. That's it. You know, um, as much as we depend on them and scientists use them and governments use them, if we wanted to use those satellites, they wouldn't really be accessible to us because for the most part, you're going to get a lot of information in code. Okay. But you mentioned the Amazon, right? Let's just say you wanted to see what was happening in the Amazon with these mines that you talked about that are indeed really deleterious to uh, the ecology in the Amazonian ecosystem. Let's say you wanted to get a real-time picture of that. Well, you know, you would be able to do that with this satellite constellation database called SkyFi. Now, and they're, and they're not just photos like Google Earth, where there's like, you know, aerial photos. These are actual satellite imagery and the analytics that go along with it. And for this, it would be like a specific mine, like in the uh, Yanomami indigenous territory in the Brazilian Amazon. We would be able to take a look at the actual mines, uh, kind of like in a citizen science way. So, so it's more than just photos, you're saying. Oh. There's analytics that go with yeah. it. That's an interpretation of the data that the satellite obtained. Right. It's not just a, a slideshow like yeah. on Google Earth. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with Google Earth. Love them. But it's not just a slideshow. It's actual usable information that if you're interested and you want to learn something, which if you're watching Star Trek, you definitely want to learn something, um, that you yeah, can go yeah. in and, and inform yourself about what's happening in, in the area. All right. So, Chuck, you have examples of these images that you're talking about? I wish I could take credit for doing it myself, but our uh, <laughs> our producers at uh, Star Talk here actually went and pulled some great images and information. Like right here, we're going to put this up. You can see the devastation from space for over a couple years in the Yanomami Brazilian Amazon. So here are some images that show you the river, and then you, you see these white areas next to the river where that used to have used trees. to have trees, but those white spots now are water. If you see the river is water, the river is white because it's water. All those white spots that you see off the river, those are where mines were, and that's why they're white now because they've left these ponds, which are filled with you know terrible chemicals and mercury. Uh, that's the residual effect of the mining operation, and you get to see it in real time. Here's another image. This is in the Peruvian rainforest. It's still part of the Amazon. And what you I'd forgotten yeah. that. That's right. I I, th I think Brazil owns the Amazon, <laughs> but no, no, yeah, no, no. There's a Peruvian Amazon Peruvian as well. Amazon, okay. and these are like high res satellite images, and the light coloring are the retention ponds or those little water holes that we saw in the other image that contain mercury and all kinds of chemicals. And you got to remember that these chemicals now, they sink into the ground, they become runoff and go into the water. And once again, 
poisoning the area, not to mention the deforestation that happens to make these clearings in the first place. Right. So if it gets into the water supply, it gets into the fish. Right. It gets into the ground, it gets into the groundwater. Right. So, so it gets into your water supply and your food supply. Your there hose. you go. That's it. You, that's that's all you have. <laughs> right. All you have. Food and water. That's all you have is food and water, baby. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's all she that's wrote. All. You, know? <laughs> you know, unless you learn how to, unless you learn how to uh, live on the air diet. You know, <laughs> if you can't live the breatharian, if, if you're a become breatharian, a breatharian. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I'm a breatharian. That was a real movement, right. by I, the way. The breatharian. Breatharian. Like, excuse me, would you mind not smoking? I'm trying to eat. <laughs> I'm a breatharian. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, here's another image. The same high res Peru images and. You can see them in even greater detail in these two images side by side. And you can see how they change, how they've grown and the devastation that's caused. Now, some of these are illegal. Some might have proper permissions, yeah. but the, a large fraction of the gold production of Brazil comes out of illegal mines. Right. Yeah. And so these satellites are basically catching them in catching the act. Catching them in the act, you know? And so uh, why don't they just shut them down? Uh you know, I think we're going to have to ask the expert that. <laughs> I don't know. Some things are some things are easier than other yeah. things to accomplish in this world. Exactly. Because I got here, we have our, our as a as a special guest, uh, Doctor Larissa Rodriguez. Uh, Let me pronounce that right I, I again. I was about to say, you, my friend, are Puerto Rican, and you messed up. Rodriguez? Rodriguez? Okay. Because <laughs> this one has an S and not a Z. Oh, okay. See, that's what threw me okay, off. Okay. Yeah, the Portuguese has it. Uh, Dr. Larissa Rodriguez, uh, welcome to Star Talk. And did I pronounce your name properly? You did. Hi, Neil. Hi, Chuck. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm very happy. And yeah, that's Larissa Rodriguez. Rodriguez. With the Port Portuguese accent. I love your education background. You have a PhD in energy. Yes, from that's the right. University of Sao Paulo. It's cool that you can get a PhD in that uh, because it is so important. It, it, energy and civilization go hand in hand, and the exploitation of energy, how you get it, where it comes from, uh, and your expertise focuses on mining, energy, and land use. At the, in, in, let me get this right, uh, Institute Escolhas. And what is that? Instituto Escolhas, which is a nonprofit uh, base here in Brazil, uh, working with sustainability. So, and, and you got it right. I got my background on energy studies, and I went into that because I'm very interested to know, like, how we as a civilization goes uh, exploring natural resources and then from energy resources, I transitioned my studies a little bit to mining and also land use. And I'm working on that, like studying how we as humans use natural resources and how we regulate that. Wow. And, you know, we take so much of it for granted that metal just shows up uh, wherever you need it, whenever you want it. Yes, there's a market price for it. But I don't think any of us or hardly ever say, where did this come from? Well, how did we obtain this? I don't know that people think I that. Mean, we can't do that. We're American. Like, <laughs> if we were to do that, <laughs> half the stuff we buy would we wouldn't be able to buy. Like, <laughs> no, our heads would explode. Exactly. Oh my god! Right. So, so we know, uh, Larissa, that satellite images of the Amazon basin, basin, or up, anywhere up and down the Amazon. Um, you found evidence of gold mining, but so what? I mean, if you're going to mine for something, you mine for gold. Why not? Why is that so differently important in this case? What is important is these days is that we do have a big problem in Brazil. And the problem is when we look at, uh, to gold, half of the gold Brazil produces is considered to be illegal. Half of it. And we are talking about more or less 50 tons per year or $2.5 billion per year. It's a lot. This is ha half the gold that comes out of, out of Brazil. Exactly. And this gold is traveling okay. the world because Brazil produces gold to export. So we produce in Brazil and then we export, meaning that the, the illegal gold is traveling the world. It's not in Brazil anymore. And 
then comes to the question that we should all ask where this gold comes from. This gold comes mainly from the Amazon region, so basically from illegal mines that have no authorization to operate whatsoever, and many of them inside indigenous territories and also in other protected areas like national parks and all that. Is it illegal because they don't have a permit, or is it illegal because you can't mine for gold on the native land no matter what? Both situations, actually, because some of them, it, they are illegal because they don't have a permit. And some of them, like inside indigenous territories and national parks, for example, they cannot have a permit because it's not allowed to mine there, not even gold or any other minerals. So what can you tell us about the environmental impact, apart from it just simply being illegal? Yes, I mean, there are very severe impacts when you talk about gold mine, especially in the Amazon, because it's the most biodiverse place on Earth. So first of the environmental impacts, what we can say, it's about deforestation because to open up a new mining pit, you deforest the area. And gold mining uses a lot of area. So we are not talking about tunnels or underground mine. We're talking on the uh, mining being done on the surface. So we're on the same page. N generally, when we think of a mine, we think of someplace very deep below the ground. But, but what you're saying is there's a whole branch of mining that's surface mining, where you need yeah. a lot of surface to put through your devices, your filterings, your machines to find something within the surface. Is that correct? That's correct. That's exactly what it is. So you're talking about uh, uh, large lands or big land and uh, on the surface, or so we're talking about uh, operations that come with excavators to open a mining pit. So the first step to it is to deforest the area, to cut down all the trees. And just for you to have an idea, in the past years, deforestation in the Amazon associated only with mining activities grew by five times. So they've been growing a lot. So meaning that illegal gold mines or legal gold mines, they are growing immensely in the Amazon over the, the past decade. So there is a lot of deforestation related to that. And the thing is, about the illegal, the illegal mining sites. They don't do land reclamation because the miners, they, don't, they do not recover the area well, after they're done. Well, well they're, they're illegal. That's like, exactly. you know, that's like your they drug dealer up. saying, by the way, I just opened a rehab. Exactly. So. <laughs> exactly. They don't yeah, do it. They're, they're not going to do it, you know. Exactly. Of course they won. I mean, they're completely illegal. So they take the gold and then run. So they abandon the area. And the picture we see when you go inside a mining like that, it's like a dead land, completely dead land. Right. You can't do anything with the land afterwards. No, and for can't. anybody here in America that's trying to figure out what this is like, it's the same, except it's legal here, uh, would be mountaintop coal mining here in America, where they literally shave off. The top oh, strip mining. Yeah, they, just they strip just mining. shave it's off the top of a mountain so they can pull out the coal. And that uh -huh. land is now unusable. It's just done. At least for another billion yeah. years. Or so. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so, I, so now you, there, there are no trees. And uh, is there any chemicals that are invoked to try to extract the gold that become like waste products? Yes, and the, the, the most dangerous one is mercury. So uh, all the gold mines in the Amazon, they use mercury. They use mercury to, to do the amalgamation, like to separate gold from the other sediments. And they're using, like, with no controls, uh, dumping to the rivers, dumping to the soil, burning, and, like, people uh, breathing the, the air with mercury. So it's a really big problem. So we're talking environmental problem, but also related to health problems. The mining operations you describe, the mercury gets into the environment, into the water supply, into the air. And so the mercury enters your body in these ways that are kind of cloaked in the air, in the water supply, in the foods, in the food stocks. So what are the consequences of mercury poisoning? And that's or the uh, symptoms, I should and, say. And, the and you mentioned it very right because it's like you don't, mercury has no taste. I mean, if, if you drink water contaminated, you don't know it. If you eat a fish contaminated, you don't know it. You don't taste it, don't feel it, you don't see it. So that's very uh, dangerous. And also the long exposure to it, as long as a person is exposed to it, the worse would be the effects and the contamination levels. 
And what is very well now is the neurological effects that the mercury contamination has. So you're, you can start with simple headaches that you won't even have idea that relates to mercury contamination, but then it can also affect our movements and literally our neurological system. So it's very dangerous. So Larissa, in reviewing the maps that we've seen from satellite imagery, there's of course the very clear and obvious ones from the Amazon, mm -hmm. where in one image there are trees and then there's another there isn't. And it, it's along, you see the riverbed, you see all the telltale signs. But I've also seen images from Peru. And what were you discovering from Peru? So what we are discovering in Peru is basically the same situation in Brazil. Of course, the, the structures can be a bit different, but the thing is like, Illegal mining is increasing, and we can see the, the expansion of these uh, mining areas in the Amazon. And basically, you see that the pattern, I mean, the pattern of occupation is a bit different. But what we see, there are like small ponds of mud. That's exactly the same way that they open up the pits and they operate the mine. So it's the same pattern in terms of the, there's the little ponds, the little uh, brown ponds we see. So these, 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 these are very large puddles of water, ponds of water. And mud. And this is, this, and this is the, 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 the byproduct of the mining operation because it takes a lot of water, I presume, correct? And actually, this can be, uh, yeah, two, two situations, actually. The, the byproduct. But also, like once you start digging the ground, water come uh, started to to spring, and then they build this pond so the the water so you can pump the uh, the water out of the mining pit and you put in a pond, and then you keep pumping water from the pond so you can, you can dig more and more and, and take the gold out. So the pond is highly contaminated, I would guess. Is that correct? Yes, because in these areas you use mercury indiscriminately. So there's no controls whatsoever. So basically with mercury. So Larissa, I see another image where there's a meandering river and we have a detail of the operations on the side of that river where the forest has been removed and it's, it's, it's been shaved bald. So, and I think I see a puddle there. One of these ponds of mud is, is everything you've described. Is that what I'm looking at in this image? Yeah, that's exactly. And the sub part of this image is here. We see a river probably already contaminated by mercury. It's inside the indigenous land, it's inside the Yanomami indigenous land, which has been under a humanitarian crisis because of the invasion of illegal miners. So we see the once pristine forest completely destroyed now at this area. So uh, it's dead land, right? And then we see, we also here see the ponds that I was mentioning that to open up uh, the mining pit, Miners need to pump water out of it, so they use these ponds. And normally these ponds, all the water there, it's contaminated. So it's, it's a pretty sad picture, I would say. Okay, so we lose the trees. We're po poisoning it with chemicals, mercury in particular. And, and what, what else, what's another, if that isn't enough. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, what else, is there anything else that, that is a consequence of this activity? Yeah, the direct consequence, and it's also very well known, at least here in Brazil, is human rights violations. Because when we talk about illegal, illegal mining in the Amazon, we are talking about the invasion of indigenous lands. So indigenous communities that, like the world saw what happened with the Yanomami people, the, the humanitarian crisis that we have there now, is that illegal miners come normally invading this area with violence. It's, there is a lot of violence involved with it. And with the disturbance in the areas, people lose their food uh, because they, they are not allowed to hunt anymore or collect fruits or also because the, their water is contaminated and also they're very exposed to new diseases. So we, we have this very side side of the story. And also even the miners themselves, they are very vulnerable. They will, are working under terrible, terrible working conditions. So there is no, like, really, there is no good sign in the story of illegal mining the Amazon, unfortunately. So, Larissa, if you are indigenous, you're probably living off the land and all the, the local resources that have sustained you for thousands of years. And if your food sources are contaminated, 
basically, this is a kind of a mini genocide just for the sake of gold. Uh, is that, am I overstating this? You're not. And actually in Brazil, we are calling it a genocide because the Yanomami people, this area where the, the territory is, is a very um, remote area in the Amazon, in Brazil, very remote. So they don't have access to any other resources than the ones that they have in forest. So other than the natural ones, older right than there. the natural yes. ones, and they've lived mm -hmm. there like since ever. And yes, forever. forever, forever, forever. That's how they used to live from the forest, and now they they don't have food anymore because they they used to hunt. And with the illegal miners inside the territory, animals are not close enough for them to hunt them. Also, there is also competition for food there now, and the water is contaminated, the fruits, all that, and also the diseases. So why don't you just shut down the illegal mines? I, this sounds like a stupid, obvious question, but if they're illegal and you know they're there, verified by satellite imagery, why, don't, why doesn't the military or whatever government agency just go on in and shut them down? Yeah, the federal police and also the environmental authority in Brazil, they both work together to crack down these operations, and sometimes they do. In the past year, the, they destroy hundreds and hundreds of illegal operations in the Amazon, so they are doing now a good job on that. And it's effective, because then, like burning the machinery and all that, you increase the risk for these operations. But the thing is, it's not always that the Brazil government put resources on that. Also, the, agents, uh, the agencies, they also need more resources to do that. So one thing that I think it's important is not only to work with law enforcement, because these operations are law enforcement, but also on the demand side. Because in Brazil, you don't know, like if you buy gold, you don't know if it's legal or illegal. There's no way to attest the orange of gold. So I truly believe we should work with a traceability system, for example. So people, consumers can know where the gold com comes from, and then you somehow will close the door for illegal gold to enter into the market. How much of this is just because we're primates and we like shiny things and that demand is never going to go away? Because the, the other side of it is you try to control the demand. And if, that, if you can't do that, maybe you will never succeed because the, the, the marketplace is stronger than your, your noble your noble environmental uh, goals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and what I think yeah. is crazy about gold, because basically we use gold like for three reasons. So for industry, like for iPhones and cell phones. And, but that's like a tiny bit of yeah. the gold we produce goes to the industry. The circuitry that, yeah, it's the wire, the circuitry, yes. Yes, mm -hmm. and it's... Gold has a very, very high transmission of electricity within it. Very low resistance to, to electrical movement. So gold has very high value in an electronics universe, but we, you don't need big chunks of it. To no, make exactly. Happen, right? No, like considering yeah. like the whole world demand for gold, like less than 10% goes to the industry. Like the other mm -hmm. 90%, it's more or less divided half by half, like by jewelry. So the jewelry industry. Yeah. Uh -huh. okay. I got a gold wedding ring, my wedding band. Yeah. But you know what? I think it's crazy. The other half goes to the banks. It's like it's a form of capital or currency. It basically. is. That's it, it is. I think it's kind of crazy that we still need uh, to extract gold from underground or from soil and then you process it and then you keep it in a bank and you do nothing with it. Nothing. There's no use. <laughs> yeah. So it's basically bankers and rappers are the problem here. <laughs> the big gold <laughs> consumers. Yes. Rappers with bling, right. yes. So you know how to, how to fix all of this? We just go, go and mine an asteroid. There are asteroids that have pre-sifted all the heavy ingredients of the universe into one place. So they're iron nickel asteroids that have very high gold concentration. We just get Grant Lasso one of them, and it'll basically put everyone else out of business overnight. <laughs> just yeah. so you know. But th but then would gold be so valuable if it's so available? You see, there that, it is. It's out in space, so you just you just bring it down as slowly as possible, so that you keep the value <laughs> you keep yeah. the value high. <laughs> you know? Oh, believe me, when when Jeff Bezos does this, he is not going to bring all the gold at once. <laughs> yeah, he's martyred on that. Yeah. <laughs> so the satellite 
imagery enables you to locate these. So in what way is the satellite data helping you? Uh, it helps a lot because, uh, of course, like if you go to a specific place in the Amazon, everybody knows there is illegal gold mines there, but not in the whole region because the Amazon is huge. So it's very important to have satellite images and monitoring because in some places, like sometimes in a very pristine area, very far from where the, the, the hub of illegal miners, uh, without the satellite images, you'll never be able to, to spot these places. So it's very important. Also, like, because the federal police, like the police, the authorities in Brazil, they have access to this, to this kind of technology as well. But me, for example, as a researcher and working for a nonprofit and trying to study the issue and develop public, policy, public policies, it's important to have data like that. Because then I can understand the problem, I, we can measure the problem, we can monitor it, and all that. Without that, it will be impossible. If you don't have data, you got nothing. Exactly. And I mean, yeah. and I think in Brazil, in the past year, we did achieve some uh, advancements in terms of regulating the market only because we were able to size the problem, to show the problem and expose that. I was very invested on researching and working with the data on that. And that was only possible because of satellite image also combined with other databases. So we wouldn't be able to, to advance with the problem in Brazil if it wasn't for it. All right, well, Larissa, thank you for being our guest on Star Talk. This is a very new material for us to cover. And we're delighted to learn about it and that we got top people like you analyzing the situation and trying to make a better world for it. So thank you. No, thank you. It's such important to talk about it. And it's, it's been an honor being here. All right. Thank you. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends over at SkyFi, the world's geospatial hub, bringing nearly instant access to high quality satellite and aerial imagery, along with expert created analytics to answer your most pressing questions. Get a bird's eye view of anywhere on the planet with SkyFi's easy to use web browser or mobile app. Browse SkyFi's commercial image archive or download free data for a specific data and location and receive it in under 24 hours. Need something more specific? You can task a satellite to capture a new image during a date range of your choosing or connect directly to SkyFi's API and integrate their powerful solutions into your business's daily workflow. With access to a network of over 150 satellites, including a variety of resolutions and sensors, unlock the full potential of our planet's data with SkyFi. Want more than just imagery? SkyFi enables you to order image-powered analytics to answer questions like, how many buildings were damaged in this disaster? Or where is flooding most likely to occur on my property? Create a free account and join over 60,000 explorers, harness the power of SkyFi's visual insights today. For more, head to startalk.skyfi.com or click the link in the description below. Well, we're back. And Chuck. Yes. We needed some expertise on what effect deforestation has on the climate. Yeah. If we're going to be start talking and complete about this topic, uh, what's going on in the Amazon, uh, so, uh, we found Dr. Jennifer Hall. Whoa. Jennifer, welcome to Star Talk. Great, thank you. Yeah, I'm really excited to be here. This is a big honor. Thank you. Excellent. No, 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 no. It, it's no. Just you. We you. You honor us. Uh, we honor I'm gonna. Us. I'm gonna go with what you said, Jennifer. <laughs> no, you're taking it. Out. Chuck is yeah. taking what you said. You can get. <laughs> no, thank you. you thank Chuck, you is that bad out there, Chuck? You need. You need a gold star today, Chuck. So, Jennifer, you're a climate scientist. Mm -hmm at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Mm -hmm. This is one of the DOE, Department of Energy labs. There's several, many actually across the country. And this is one of them managed by the University of California, Berkeley. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. So you, you specialized in the earth climate systems modeling. Is that right? And, yeah. and okay, yeah. but how about humans? How, how do we play into that modeling? Yeah, that too. Yeah. So within the whole global earth system, I focus a lot more on the terrestrial land component. So kind of understanding how ecosystems are being carbon sinks and carbon sources. 
Uh, but you're right, the human component is a very big part of that. It's the decisions we're making of land use change, land cover change, what we're doing to different forests, different grasslands management. So yeah, the human component is also a, bit, a big part of it. On the risk that you use colloquial jargon there, <laughs> when you say a carbon sink, please tell me what you mean by that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So forests, you know, all around the world and all different different vegetation uh, through photosynthesis, it will pull in CO2 for us. So all the CO2 that we're polluting every day in climate change, it will pull in CO2 and let out oxygen. So this is the, the carbon sink that will go into, into natural vegetation. Nice. So it pulls in the CO2 and it keeps it. Yeah, well, there, it keeps it in the tree. You're not breathing the CO2 that's in the tree. It, right? it, there is a flux of it. So there, there is a flux that comes and goes during photosynthesis and respiration, but there is a part that stays stored and locked into the tree. So we want to try to keep that pulled in, keep that sequestered, and not try to disturb these forests where we disrupt, disrupt that balance and that flux of more, more going out than coming in. Do you have a special focus? Because in this episode, we're, we're thinking about the rainforest, the tropical rainforest, of course, the, the preeminent among them is the one in Brazil. And we've seen some deforestation there related to mining. And so uh, do, you, do you have a focus there or is that just part of your total modeling that you care about? Yeah, it, it, the Amazon is a big major focus, but this um, couple projects that I work on, you know, we do care about all tropical forests globally and pan-tropically. Um, but yeah, you're right that the Amazon basin does play a huge role in curbing the, the climate crisis. So, you know, there's about, give or take, 100, 150 billion tons of carbon stored in the, these trees. And if that was to, to go up and that carbon would go into the atmosphere of CO2, that's about 10 years worth of all of just our global humanity emissions of CO2. So so it's a big, yes, yeah, source of carbon that's stored, um, and it's really important to really preserve its capacity and keep sequestering this carbon and mitigate climate change. It, it's been analogized as, or, or, or personified as the lungs of the earth, the of but the I earth. don't think that's right, right? Aren't there other Ah, look at you, sources... gotta be a killjoy, huh? <laughs> What's <laughs> Yes. I mean, it sounds all poetic sounds and it makes a great great. headline. Yeah. You know, they're, they're plowing down the lungs of the <laughs> earth. Yeah. The earth. <laughs> but I looked at the numbers and and as important as Amazon is, it's not the most important lungs of the earth. Am I, am I right there? Yeah, you're right. There are definitely other, I mean, the oceans and phytoplankton and a lot of other things also produce tons of oxygen and all other, you know, kind of forest tropical systems throughout, throughout the world. And it's funny that it is kind of called the lungs of, of the earth. Um, it's poetic, it's poetic. But, you know, but it's I, I like it's being, it's, I, it really should be the reverse lungs of the earth because it does absolutely the opposite of what our lungs do. Oh, interesting. Yeah, our lungs pull in oxygen and then through transference puts it into our bloodstream, pulls out the CO2 from that bloodstream, and then we oh, excel so it's the that. opposite. So it's, the, it's the opposite of what lungs do. Yeah, Jennifer, what do you got to say about that? It is. I know. It's, it's the exact opposite it's the exact of exact opposite of a lung. Yeah. However, I think the message is, hey, you like breathing, right? Breathing's good. And, you know, this is, this, this is what this is doing. This is helping us. You like this oxygen? This is helping you like us oxygen breathe. today? You like oxygen? You like breathing? It's the lungs of the earth. Yeah. Exactly. We like clean air. We like oxygen. So, yeah, right. so people think lungs. They think breathing. They think oxygen. And forests do pr produce oxygen for us, pull in CO2. You're right, where lungs do do the opposite of that. They pull in oxygen, let out CO2. Um, but but yeah, there's so many other ecosystem services that, that the Amazon provides. And I kind of like to focus on all those other ecosystem services too, instead of just- You call them services like it's a bank or something, well, you know? No. <laughs> yeah, which it's an interesting term that people use because I think we do want to try to think of it as a commodity and something that does have a money value on it. And it is oh, something we should okay. value. It's a, you get the economists to listen to you yeah. that wouldn't otherwise care. Well, believe yeah. it or not, there's a- uh, international movement around uh, of underfoot to try and pay uh, Brazil and other countries that uh, where the Amazon is located to not cut down trees because it is such a commodity. Yeah. So it's like, why don't we commodify it? How about this? You guys don't oh, cut down the trees. Mm -hmm. You don't deforest. We give you this much money. 
Yeah, yeah. And there, there's a lot surrounding that of making sure that that's done appropriately in the right way and with the right safeguards of protecting people's livelihoods. Wait, wait, Chuck, I got a tree in my backyard. Pay me to not cut it down right now. <laughs> Here's some money. <laughs> You gotta let me know what kind of tree it is, because if it if it's a ficus, nobody gives a damn. Yeah. yeah. Wait, wait. If the Amazon is not the lungs of the planet, or sorry, the inverse lungs of the planet, and if we give that to the plankton and the uh, the, phy the phytoplankton, then what is it to us? if it's not our lungs. Yeah, exactly. Well, it does supply a lot of oxygen, but yeah, there's lots of other ecosystem services that it does provide. And services of being like just things that really do benefit us and benefit humanity that is almost invaluable to put a price on. So giving us air, making sure we have oxygen and we could breathe, but they also purify the water for us, which is very invaluable. They help to renew soil fertility and cycle the movement of nutrients and Forests and the roots help stop erosion, landslides. They mitigate floods and droughts. And one of the coolest things that I think is they really help to moderate uh, extreme weather events. So with the trees intact, they could help stop storms, you know, and do windbreaks and everything. And through the shading and cycling of water that they provide, they really help stabilize our climate. In what way does the Amazon forest mitigate drought? So tropical forests really can act as their own local water pump, which I think is super interesting. So forests will receive a certain portion of their own water supply naturally through a recycled rain that they have made. So they could act as their own conduits of their own water pumps. And um, this is occurring because as, as you know, storms and everything kind of comes in and trees hold this water in the soil uh, and then through pumping out water through the little conduits of the trees, through the leaves, through evapotranspiration, they can then create their own clouds above them, their own, own rain. So they could really kind of help, yeah, recycle and reuse reuse this water. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty intense. Yeah. Okay. So what you what you're saying is they have so much stored water in their root system, in their leaf system, in their the body, the physical body mm -hmm. of the trees themselves, that they can survive a drought in ways that other vegetative regions of the world could not. Yeah. Exactly. Is that, is that what yeah, you mean yeah, by Yeah, because that? they're okay. so dense, so big that, yeah, that right. that's just more forested, vegetated area of storing this water. And they can maintain this water recycling that kind of goes back and forth. Where if you had other ecosystems where it's smaller vegetation, you know, more of the rain that comes through is runs off or is leaked somewhere else. And then it can't. It doesn't keep it. Yeah, yeah. it doesn't keep okay. it as much. Yep. So let's get to the, the satellite images that we saw where there's a mining operation that is involves deforestation and contamination of surrounding soils and, and, and water uh, watersheds. Mm -hmm. So is this small compared to what you normally would concern yourself with on a global scale? Or just concern is the, is the trend line bad? Is that really what's going on? It still is concerning, yeah, because we we do look at you know every little piece that that's being deforested and where, um, because in kind of putting a little bit of grounding kind of on deforestation in in the Amazon is that to date about around seventeen to eighteen percent of the Amazon basin has been deforested. So that's around 100 million square kilometers. Damn. Um, yeah. And most of this, the main driver is actually cattle ranches. Cattle ranches. Or beef yeah. and dairy. And then second next is, is mining. Um, so this rate and status of deforestation, you know, is tricky as we track it over time because it depends a lot on human choices, human decisions, politics. Um, and there's been trends where deforestation did hit a peak around like 2000. Um, but then in the 2010s, there was this really large effort and a very successful effort to really curb deforestation. Um, and in 2012, deforestation had declined almost 80% in the Brazilian Amazon, which was a huge, large feat. And it was a, a great, great success. Um, 
Wait, 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 wait. That's that, excuse me, yeah. Jennifer. That's a low bar that's to say we succeeded by having less deforestation. Know, it's still occurring. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, you got to up your up your game there, Jennifer. True. Right. We need so, to stop it. So it's, uh, yeah, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't celebrate less deforestation. Yeah. That is you know, true. I guess I try to celebrate right. small wins, but you're you're right. It's so, yeah, just small wins. <laughs> so the parts that have been deforested, if you de- if if people gather wise people gather and they declare that we want to regrow this back into rainforest. Mm -hmm. Can that happen? And if it can, over how much time? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So that's a large effort that's happening is really restoration, regrowth. Um, So just quickly, in addition to to my role at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, I actually do work for um, a nature tech company that's doing just this, that's trying to restore and regenerate degraded forested lands. Um, and that it could work. It could definitely happen. And but why wouldn't nature do that by itself? It did it the first we, time. We need to give why it a leg it up a little yeah. bit now. So so that's the thing is that um, forest nature tech- hates us. That's why. Oh <laughs> no no! It's just that I've been. I, I, where was I? Somewhere uh, I was in Hawaii or uh, somewhere else where there's a volcanic, you know, shelf off to the side, mm-hmm. and th- maybe the volcano was like 80 years ago or the the the. the this spillage and there's like plants growing in the lava field oh, yeah right yeah. so nature is like you know i don't care if it's lava i'm gonna grow there anyway I, i'm going up a driveway there's a crack in the pavement and a mushroom is coming up through the crack yeah why is it that all you need to grow a healthy plant is a crack in the pavement yeah and you tell me you can't grow a tree in the amazon well, maybe we should pave the over uh, the uh, areas that's <laughs> we should pave them over and then just uh, put some cracks in them <laughs> Thank you, Chuck, for your <laughs> problem solved. There you go. Problem solved by We're Chuck. Good. Yeah. No, that's such a great point. I mean, nature is resilient. Nature wins. It grows and cracks. It grows after lava fields. So, yes, nature will regenerate. Um, but we're in a time crunch with with climate change. And so we want to give nature a leg up. We want to try to do assisted regeneration. We're, we're speeding the process. We're not really doing yeah, okay. it. We're yeah. speeding the process. And also, it, so there's this um, idea called additionality, where yes, nature will regrow on its own, but we want to pull in additional carbon to make up for what we're putting in the atmosphere so we could try to get at this net zero, because we're still constantly burning fossil fuels. And as we do that, we want to add in even more additional carbon into regrowth. So that's why we do right. this assisted regeneration. And also, so quickly to talk about forest degradation is increasing. So there's it's very, very different from deforestation is just, you know, the complete change of, of a land type where you took a forest, you completely changed it into cattle grazing, mining, urban roads. Um, but forest degradation is just as impactful. It, it covers the exact same area in the Amazon as what's being deforested. And it's, it's harder to, to track and it's more pervasive because it's these smaller scale disturbances, things like fires or, or logging or drought stress. Um, so that that's happening all across the Amazon and forest degradation is going up. So that's why we also want to try to recover to combat both deforestation and degradation. All right. So your models, you know, when I think of climate models, just coming to it as a physicist, I think of, well, there's the energy from the sun, there's the temperature gradients in the atmosphere and how... You know, what's the inventory of energy? Where is it going? Where is it coming from? Mm-hmm. How is it coming in? How is it getting reflected back? So that's what I think of. Exactly. But since you're, you're worried about land, how many parameters are in your models? That must be huge. Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> and, and the more parameters you have, it seems to me the harder it would be to have confidence in your conclusions because there's so many knobs you have to turn Mm -hmm. and trust that you turn them the right way. Yeah. Jennifer responds with, that's why I'm a boss, Neil. (laughs) That's why I'm a boss, because I I, I, I do it like that. (laughs) I I got it. So so you have all of this, and then then we have the satellite data. So it seems to me you might be limited in the precision or the accuracy of your models by the kinds of data you can get from satellites that do see all the land masses of the world. Mm-hmm. So can you break down, what are your knobs that you're turning in your software? Yeah, you're, you're right that there are a lot of parameters that, that go into land processes, vegetation processes. 
And we, we work on all of those and we really use remote sensing a lot more now to help us really. Satellite, make... satellite. Yes, yeah, sorry. Remote sensing, yes. satellite. Remote sensing from satellite yeah. and remote sensing from, from drones as well. So airborne and yeah. space. See, right here, we are remote sensing you over this. Yeah. <laughs> true, true, very true. <laughs> Yeah. I remote sense you. Over you're the, in the Berkeley right, mm -hmm. over the internet, right? So you mean satellite sensing? Yes, satellite, yes. Okay, Sat satellite, satellite mm -hmm. sensors. Yeah, sensors that are on satellite in space. That's our kind of re remote sensing that that we're doing. So we could use you know these high resolution satellite images that are really able to show uh, distinct changes over time, and and this is useful when we look at time series analysis. So you could see on the one hand on on left. There, there's more vegetation cover. And then when you look at the, the image on the right, there is less vege vegetation cover here. Um, and so this is really important when, when we do have less and less vegetation coverage, then it just makes these larger edges and more of the just uh, disfragmented forest creates more forest edges, which what that does is it it heats up the, the edge of the forest. So before like a forest canopy, it can really help with shading and cooling. But when you have more exposed ground to, to radiation and to the sun, it heats up that area, which then kind of gets heater or heater, hotter areas into, into the, the forest. And just more of that open area will just lead for more encroachment of maybe things like, like fires or logging or human encroachment. Um, so yeah, so it's really important to be able to have the, these high resolution images to see where this vegetation change is occurring. Is it expanding over time? Is it becoming less over time? And as forest ecologists, we really want to try to track that and, and monitor it. So when I'm talking about edge effects, that, that means that b before we have you know an intact, continuous forest, where over large areas of land, large area of hectares, there's forest that's all being intact. And when it's all intact, it has its own microclimate. It's cooler underneath it. It cycles water and energy. Um, but when you degrade forest or when there's different forest fragmentations, like we're seeing here in the, the images, it will create these, these open boundaries where there's open land next to continuous forest. And that's that edge. And the edge effects is, is a type of degradation that, that we see into the forest because there's change in temperature and radiation um, and those those that edge can then lead to to more degradation of that intact continuous forest. I personally you know like to look a lot at forest disturbance and regrowth that we talked about so I like to pay attention to things that track growth and recovery and a lot of this is changes in forest structure. Mm -hmm. So for this you know we'll we'll use something maybe called lidar which stands for light detection and ranging. And LIDAR is great because it can penetrate through the forest canopy and can give us good vertical information. Jennifer, if L stands for light and you're penetrating the forest canopy, you're not using visible light for this. Because last time I tried to look through a forest canopy, I couldn't. And my eyes use visible light. So presumably there are other frequencies of light that do have this penetration that the satellites are providing. So that sounds like a really good place to be because otherwise you're you're blind to what's going on in, on, on the ground levels, right? Exactly. Yep. You're exactly right. Yeah. There's these multispectral bands that, that, that we use on a lot of these different sensors that can do everything from visible light to, to near infrared. Um, and yeah, and that, that just allows us to see a lot of different things and see a lot of really cool vegetation traits even, which I really think is interesting. So in addition to the forest structure, we could also look at other indicators that are proxies for vegetation productivity. Um, so some things that we could detect are proxies for how plants are photosynthesizing and if they're healthy. Um, and yeah, so there are sensors that have these specific spectral bands that are actually associated with chlorophyll content. So they can look at something called solar induced fluorescence, which is when, when the leaves and the vegetation canopy will light up when plants are absorbing uh, white light and when like photosynthetic activity is occurring. So yeah, yeah, the, these sensors are very helpful at looking at forest structure, different traits, different variables. So Jennifer, it's 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 pretty clear that in a mining operation where they've removed the trees, you don't have to you don't need special satellite wavelengths to see through the canopy because it's on full display mm -hmm. anyway. Mm -hmm. Really then uh, 
your LIDAR and other sort of uh, specialized satellites uh, will help you get through the clouds. Because I, as, as, if I remember my Earth maps, rainforests have mostly cloud. We don't put telescopes on the equator because it's mostly cloud cover exactly, there. Yeah. Is that right? So yeah. half of what you got to get through is a cl- before you even get to the canopy, you got to get through the clouds. Exactly. Yep, that's exactly true. So so that's kind of a hard challenge of making sure that we use the right near infrared band and we we use yeah, the right capability to try to get through the clouds or just repeat measurements over and over and hope for a non-cloudy day. So it, it is a little challenging. <laughs> <laughs> now, now there's so much data uh, when we think of uh, you know, a, a buzz term, at least the last 10 years, has been crowdsourcing the analysis of data. And if people have access to satellite imagery, uh, maybe they could help out if they know what to look for. Mm-hmm. Is that something you guys have considered? Oh, yeah, e- exactly. Yeah, that there's so much more ways to be able to do crowdsourcing because the data is becoming more accessible, easier to use. There's better computing power better online platforms to really being able to interrogate the data and look at the data. So, yeah, I think it's really a, a exciting time to really be able to play with it in different in different yeah. ways. That's kind of what, uh, you know, uh, SkyFi is all about. The, the, oh, the SkyFi people, the, yeah. The yeah, they try to democratize. Yeah. D- democratize the access to yeah, data. They, they made it. Right. They made it so that anybody can pretend to be Jennifer, you know. <laughs> <laughs> No, there are no substitutes. No, you. <laughs> Do you ever take information that you see in the natural restoration after a disturbance, like a fire or something, and learn something that will help you assist in restoration of an area that might have been degraded from something we've done? What he's saying is, why uh, have you done anything useful? <laughs> Instead of, <laughs> I just translated what he said. Are you just oh, an, are you just analyzing but not helping the situation? Oh, looking that's really terrible. Well yeah. that, that's I funny. Didn't, I didn't, that was kind I of the question, so. but I didn't mean it like that. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. No, I hope so. I mean, I'm really, really excited about new developments and new things that we're doing to to fight climate change, and I, I am really hopeful about these new advancements. Like, for example, I'm I'm working with a company called Cultivo that's helping to regenerate nature and restore degraded lands um, through this process called nature-based climate solutions. And it's great because, you know, like we mentioned, forests help us mitigate climate change by storing carbon, pulling in carbon. Trees have been doing this for centuries. And as long as they're not under threat and as long as we keep them healthy, um, you know, they could keep doing this o- over time. And, you know, we really need to change the incentives for countries and different commodity sectors to have this large economic incentive to help restore lands and make sure these forests are durable to disturbance. And we're we're thinking about the livelihoods of, of people who live in these forests. And something that I'm super excited about is that the UN climate change conferences uh, they they had this pledge to stop deforestation, which is to halt and reverse deforestation by 2030. And many Amazonian countries, you know, are really taking this seriously and doing it. And Brazil is is making great great movements. And um, just a small little interesting side note that I, I think is interesting is the highest greenhouse gas emitting countries in the world. You know, the top four are like us and China um, and Russia. They, it's burning fossil fuels in the energy sector that accounts for their biggest greenhouse gas emissions. But in Brazil, it's different. They already use a lot of renewable energies, and their majority of climate change emissions is not from burning fossil fuels, but it's this land use change and deforestation and cattle ranching. So if we could halt deforestation by 2030, and since they already use renewable energy sector, they could really become a net zero emissions country and hit some of their targets before other people. Um, and this means really reducing their emissions by by a lot. So, and yeah, the Amazon forest benefits, you know, the entire world and and it's, it's really helpful to curb climate change and making sure we're thinking about these large ecological and social biodiversity aspects um, that the Amazon brings. Well, Jennifer, thank you for sharing your expertise. No, thank you for this opportunity. This was, this was really wonderful. All right. This has been Star Talk. Chuck, always good to have you, man. Always a pleasure. Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist. Keep looking up. <laughs> <laughs>